praise I will give thanks Oh, I will give thanks When the road are here. Glad that everybody's walking in together to worship. Um, it's great to have everybody. Um, I want to remind you, if you've got a bulletin um, in your hand, in your seat, that's great. Um, there's a connect card inside there. And I'd love for you to take time to fill it out later on this morning. If there's anything that you'd love for us as a church uh, family to be praying over, um, you can put that in. And then as you leave here, there are a few baskets at each of the entrances and stuff. You can fill that out and put that in the baskets there. Online, you've got the digital connect card that you can uh, fill out for us. Let us know that you're tuning in. Um, anything that you'd love to be um, praying about, uh, we want to be partnered with you as well. So let's take a moment. Let's turn around. Let's welcome one another as we enter into this place to worship our Lord today. Yeah. Glad you're online today. 
Um, just want to say a shout out to Josiah.
darkness now is ending in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life lift it up together you reign above it all you reign above it all over the universe and over every heart there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all on the cross the word was finished God you pulled out your
worship you. We magnify your name together as a church family. Lord, we want to lift your name higher than above all things. Lord, recognize that you reign over all things in our lives. So Lord, we, we just give a life to you. Lord, as we walk with you, God, we want to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. May we see you. So Sabrina and I celebrate our 15-year anniversary in January of this year, uh, this coming January. And 15 years ago, when we were getting ready to get married, we had made plans for our honeymoon to go on a cruise, and uh, which was kind of funny because we were young enough, she had to have a note from her parents that would allow us to go on a cruise. So even though we're married, and uh, so that was kind of fun. But either way, we get on a cruise. If you've ever been on a cruise, you know this, that one of the things that you do on a cruise ship is you get off the cruise ship. You go on excursions. And, uh, and so one of the excursions that we booked uh, in our cruise was an excursion on the island of the Dominican Republic. And uh, apparently, this was the first time that, uh, that the cruise line had stopped. It was either in the Dominican Republic, or maybe just at that port. I, I don't really recall. But they had not gone there before, or at least recently, and apparently they did not vet their, their excursion companies very well because we booked an excursion where they were supposed to take us out and see like a number of kind of, um, you know, historical sites, some neat areas, feed us dinner, and then take us back to the ship all in, you know, two or three hours, something to that effect. And uh, we get on this we get on this tour bus with twenty some other folks, and uh, and they begin taking us to places that weren't on the itinerary. And at first we thought, well, maybe it was just closed or something. But then we realize all of the places that they're taking us, they're taking us. There's people trying to hustle us for money and like shake us down at every one of these 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 stops with this bus. And then eventually, instead of dinner, they take us, I kid you not, to a shady like convenience store. And they gave us crackers. And that was dinner, supposedly. And which we did we were like, that will pass. Thank you. And, uh, and and it was so funny because I mean everybody was kind of on this weird mix of like kind of afraid, but also we're like, we're getting together in this cool group. So we're like, I don't think you can kidnap an entire bus. So we're probably okay. The cruise line, they were they were losing it because they couldn't get in contact with anybody. They didn't know where it was, and they kept us like five hours longer than they were supposed to. And the cruise ship was trying to figure out where all these people people were. They're like, I guess we've lost an entire group of people. I kid you not, we got to the end and the whole group got together and we unionized. We're like, hey, we're going to Carnival, the cruise line, and we're going to say, we want our money back for this particular one, which they actually gave us back. And the reason was, is because the itinerary did not match what actually happened. We were supposed to see these incredible sights, and what we ended up having done is being shaken down for money in a bunch of back alleys. Today, what I want us to do is I want us to look at the itinerary and look at some of the things that describe what we're going to see in heaven. And unlike the experience that Sabrina and I had in the Dominican Republic, I believe we have a good and honest tour guide here in the book of Revelation that can share with us a better picture of what's actually in store. You see, there are certain identifiable landmarks anytime you travel. If you go to the coasts, you're going to see really pretty beaches. If you go out west, you're going to see mountains. If you go to New York City, you can see Broadway. These are identifiable landmarks that help us know the kind of things and where even in some effect where we 
are. And God has given us identifiable landmarks as it relates to heaven, and we're going to look at some of those today. Now, if you will, turn with me to Revelation 21. Uh, Each week we've been looking here in Revelation 21 and 22 because that is the single largest section of Scripture which speaks about heaven. And so we're going to take some time. We're going to start where we have been and uh, in verse 1, and we're going to add in much of chapter 21 today. So let's start together, chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. We've looked at that word then of Revelation 21, 1. We we looked at that last week and said that the then referred to something, that it was connected to time, and the time that it was connected to was in reference to the return of Christ. You see, after the return of Jesus, that triggers the then of Revelation 21, verse 1. And we see this. We see when the Lord returns, the then happens. And what is the then? The then is... I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth and the first heaven passed away. We try to imagine what heaven must be like. Is heaven a, a wispy, ethereal place? Is it, is it like kind of foggy and hard to see very far in the distance? And are we, are we on a cloud strumming a harp? What, what is it that heaven is? Is going to be like. Well, John receives this vision of heaven and says he sees a new heaven and a new earth. He starts off with what we're going to experience is this new heaven, new earth. Now, that concept of a new heaven and a new earth is not something new in Scripture. In other words, we didn't get to Revelation 21 before we learned about God's plan to make a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, we see it both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, Isaiah the prophet says this. He says, see, I will create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. When we try to picture what heaven will be like, a good place to start is with what I introduced to you two weeks ago called continuity. That what God is doing in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 is really the continuance of what he started in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Remember Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates all that we see, know, and understand here in this life. And this creation, he says, is very good because this creation is not plagued by sin and death. Not in Genesis 1 and 2. It's not until in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sin against God, that sin and death and destruction and decay and hardship and arrogance and and crying and all of these things that just cause pain within our lives comes into existence. And this idea of continuity, again, is that God is going to pick up with where he started before sin entered the world, the first two chapters of the Bible. Now, Peter tells us the same thing. Uh, Peter, in the New Testament, tells us that, that God's plan is to take this new heaven and this new earth and bring it to fruition. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, Peter says this, he says, But the, on the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Peter reveals a couple things here. Uh, Two things probably of note, at least for today's conversation, two things of note that Peter tells us here in 2 Peter 3. And the first is this. The first is that the Lord's return will come as a surprise. He says the the return of the Lord is going to come like a thief 
Right? We don't plan for a thief to break in and steal our stuff. This comes as a surprise to us. A lot of times, people try to figure out, they try to link thoughts and ideas and concepts together throughout Scripture to get a, a handle on when the Lord is going to return. And people have been doing this from literally the moment that Jesus ascended into heaven. People have been waiting, looking, trying to figure out when's he coming back. And so it's not really a surprise to us that even to this day, 2,000 years later, we're still doing the same thing, wondering when the Lord is going to return. But Jesus is constantly throughout his time in ministry saying, hold on a second, instead of trying to figure out when I'm coming back, it would be much wiser for you to be ready right now. He's far less concerned about us being understanding of his return and far more concerned with us being ready for his return. He says, listen, you're going to have two guys in a field and one's going to be taken, the other one's not, and he's going to wonder what in the world just happened. Jesus said it's going to be like a bunch of brides waiting for a groom to show up and some of them are ready, but a bunch of them aren't. Jesus' point is, listen, this is going to happen and you're not going to be expecting it when it does the second thing that Peter tells us here when he says that the Lord's return, the then of Revelation 21.1, the second thing he tells us is this, is that the Lord's return initiates the destruction of the current heaven and the current earth. So when the Lord comes, the then of Revelation 21.1 has now happened, which means the second word of Revelation 21.1 and so forth can happen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth was destroyed. And what's Peter say? Peter says, that, and the Lord returns, that the earth and the heavens will be destroyed and it all laid bare in front of everything. Now, here's the thing about fire. Fire destroys, we know that. And in fact, we see that it destroys the earth. But fire does something else. Fire also purifies, it refines 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, just three verses down from where we just read, look what Peter says. He says, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And notice what he says, where righteousness dwells. So what happens with the destruction by fire of this new heaven, this new earth, is that not only is it destroyed, it's also purified. And this new heaven, this new earth that God creates is one where righteousness rules and dwells. Not sin, not death, not sorrow and heartache. You see, the new heaven and the new earth will be a place where there is no more sin. And hear this, because this is important, a question that oftentimes people ask and, and wonder and worry about. That in this new heaven, this new earth, sin has been destroyed. And that means that the capacity, the presence, the desire, and the availability for sin are no more. Maybe some of you worry and have been fretting in your hearts going, my goodness, what happens if I get to heaven and I made it? And then I mess up and God goes, see ya. That's what, because this is how we think in our current mind about our earth. But that earth, this earth is going to be laid bare. It's going to be destroyed and refined. And what God creates is a place where what rules? Righteousness. You see, the decision that you make in this life to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus, the surrendering of your life to Jesus in this life is your decision for the next to live under the rule and authority of King Jesus. And so when all is laid bare, when fire destroys and purifies, then sin is destroyed along with it, our capacity, desire, ability to sin. And we live in a place, a spectacular place that is no longer thwarted by sin. You see, God designed this earth, this one, to be the place, a spectacular home for his people. But sin has destroyed that. And when the Lord Jesus destroys sin... Once and for all, the place that we will exist will be a place of goodness and hope, of joy, where sin is no more. And when Christ returns and destroys that, that's what we have to look forward to. It's the continuation of Genesis 1 and 2, but with sin once and for all defeated. 
So here's what I want us to do. Let's look in Revelation 21. If that's what's in store, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness reigns, let's look in Revelation 21 and see some of the things that the Lord shares with us about what this new heaven and this new earth will be like. Let's start in verse 10 of Revelation 21. Here's what we read. John says this. John's the writer of the book of Revelation. He says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates, and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three on the north and three on the south and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There are three landmarks here today that I'm going to point out here in Revelation 21, at least three that I'm going to point out that give us some indication of what this new heaven and new earth are going to be like. And so the first one that I want to point out to you, John tells us that he sees the city come down, and the first thing that he sees that he makes mention of is a wall. But this is no ordinary wall. In fact, it's giant. And he goes on to describe this wall in verse 15. Look what he says. It says, The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide, and he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. Now, understand that John writes here a style of literature that often uses words to, under, to create and paint pictures. And one, admittedly, the challenges of Revelation is trying to figure out what's literal and what's figurative, what is to be interpreted as this is what we're seeing and what is to be interpreted as this is the picture of what it's going to be like. And this is one of the greatest challenges of reading the book of Revelation. But regardless, as we look at this today, we can learn something about this landmark that, that John shares with us when he says there is this city whose walls are shaped like a cube, length, width, height. These walls are all the same dimensions, and he says they are 12,000 stadia. Now, that's, that's like, let's say, about 1,400 miles. All right, to kind of put that into perspective, like the city of New York from its highest Point, it's, I think it's north, be northeast to its southwest. I think that's right if I'm thinking of a map. It's about 35 miles. Okay, so he says he sees a wall that's, that's 1,400 miles. Now, whether we're supposed to understand this as 1,400 miles or whether we're supposed to understand this as a really big wall, the picture is the same. And in fact, as we think about what John might be saying here, the numbers 10 and the numbers 12 in Greek writing, especially apocalyptic writing, oftentimes refer to things that were complete and full. And so you could look at this and say, well, he could be talking about a, a wall that's 1,400 miles long. I mean, that's beyond what you can even see. Or he could be talking about a wall that is complete, 12, times complete, 10, times complete, 10, times complete, 10 to get 12,000. You could look at it either way. Here's the point. It's massive. It is, a, it is a monstrosity. And this wall is not just 1,400 miles. It's not just complete upon complete upon complete upon complete. It is that far that way, and then it goes that far that way, and then it comes that far back this way, and then it comes back into close up a cube, and then it goes that far high. The thing is a monstrosity. What, what's this point here? What's this point? We, we, we learn here from, from this new heaven, this new earth. We're talking about a place where sin reigns no more and where these walls are these monstrosities. We could do this. We could think of heaven as this physical earth free from sin and a place that's huge and a place that's safe. 
You see, this, this wall is not just a long wall and a wide wall and a tall wall. Look at verse 17. We learn something else about this wall. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. That's about 18 inches as a cubit or so. It's about the length of your forearm. 144 cubits thick. So this wall is massively thick. What's that? A couple hundred feet thick by 1,400 miles. <laughs> I mean, the wall is huge. L listen, cities were known by their ability to protect their people with its walls. This is why when the Israelites enter into Canaan, the promised land, the very first thing that they do when they come into the promised land is they surround this great city known as Jericho, whose walls were impenetrable. And they surround this city, and with nothing but trumpets, God brings down the walls of Jericho. A city is known by its walls. The walls are what provided safety for the people. And so in this new city, in this, in this place, we can think of heaven as we try to put kind of physical terms to what this new earth and new heaven is going to look like. We can think of a city on this physical earth that is free from sin. It's huge and it's safe. Let's keep looking because that's not the only thing we're told about this city. Uh, we also learn about its foundations. Let's look in verse 19 and we'll see that. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth, fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. All right, so we have not only a city with these monstrosity of walls, but John says that when he looks at these walls, he realizes that they're resting on a foundation. Again, with this number 12, very well just could be indicating what? An idea of a completeness, a fullness. And, and if you think about a building or a wall or anything, you have a foundation. Right? If you're going to build, you build it on a foundation, and that foundation is what holds up, it gives stability and structure to the building, the barn, the fence, whatever it is that you're building. It's got to have a foundation. Well, what John says, he goes, no, I don't see just a foundation. I see 12 foundations. What's, again, the idea? That this is complete, that this is, this is not going anywhere. This city is immutable. It, it's not changing. It's structurally going to be there. And nothing can knock it off its base because why? It doesn't just have one foundation or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 or 11. It has 12 foundations. And these foundations are not just made out of kind of cheap cinder block that some Somebody cobbled together. No, these, these foundations are incredible. They're made out of stone that are in and of themselves precious. They, these stones have been meticulously and intentionally placed so their brilliance is seen, and each one lending to the increasing, ever increasing strength of these walls that are 1,700 miles long and wide and tall and hundreds of feet thick. What's the picture? The picture is this new heaven. We think of it as this earth. We think of it as this, this physical earth. It's a place free from sin. It's huge. It's safe. It's magnificent. Think of the stones, these precious stones, and it's eternal. Its foundations are never going to go anywhere. It's got 12 foundations, not just one. Nothing can shake this place. It's eternal. And John goes on to say that it's not just the foundations that he sees. He also sees this in verse 21. He sees the gates. He says there are 12 gates that were, 12 great, that were made of 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold. It was pure as transparent glass. We were already told here earlier in the chapter that around this wall there were 12 gates, and each gate... On each side of the wall, there are three gates. What's the picture? Well, again, we have this idea of 12, this idea of completeness. But here's what I think he's getting at. You have this city that's surrounded by a wall, but from all directions, you can enter into this great city. Bear in mind what John's, his situation. John is on a prison island. He's, he's under control of someone else. 
But in his mind, in his concept, there's sort of this fledgling idea that's happening in the first century, which is that Christianity, that Christians are not just Jewish people, but rather people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. That the faith and understanding of, of the God of Jacob has now found in Jesus Christ. And you'll know, if you, if, as you read through the New Testament, there's a little bit of this growing pain where the Jews are trying to realize that this faith that they have held on to for generations is founded in Jesus. And that it's not just the Jews, but Gentiles too, who call in the name of the Lord Jesus, who will be saved. And so John writes about this city who's got this massive wall, right? This magnificent physical place. It's safe. It's free from sin. And he says, from all directions, people can come to this city through these gates. Remember Jesus' words? I want you to go into all of the world. And I want you to tell people about me. It's the Great Commission. Make disciples everywhere you go, from all the corners of the earth, go make disciples, teaching them about me, baptizing them into me. And from all directions, we see there's gates receiving people into this place. So maybe we could say it like this. Heaven is this physical place, free from sin. It's huge. It's safe. It's magnificent. It's eternal. And this is a city of people coming in from all over the world, calling on the name of Jesus for salvation. Revelation, though, tells us there's more about these gates, more than just that these gates exist. Verse 25 says this, on no day, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. See, at nighttime, a city would close its gates. All the business, all the commerce oftentimes happened right at the kind of the, the interchange of the walls of the city, right where the city kind of stopped and the gates was a place where people would sit and do business. It's where people would, life, social life, it was where everything took place. But at nighttime, the gates were closed and everybody came into the city. Why? Because there were marauders and, and besiegers. There were criminals and thieves. There were armies that could come at night and attack the city. But what's, what's John say? He says, no, 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 not in this place though. Not in this place. You see, these walls, these walls have gates, and those gates, can, those gates can stay open all the time because there is no night. In other words, there is nothing coming of danger. Again, reinforcing this idea of its safety. This, it's a physical place. We think of heaven. Think of this. Think of a physical earth free from sin, a place that's safe and magnificent and eternal. And it's got people from all over the world and they're coming and they're going as they please in and out of the city for the gates are never closed in this city. And the people are going and experiencing all that, it, that God has for them in this world. Again, we think about, well, what is it that they're coming and going and doing? Well, let's think Continuity. Again, let's think continuity. Continuity tells us that the things of Genesis 1 and 2, things that you and I still do today, are the sort of things that people can come and go and do in this eternity, this physical place of free, safe, enjoyable life that God has in store for us. What are some of the things that we do? Ask yourself, what do you like doing? Sports, eating, traveling, socializing, learning, hiking, working. Imagine doing all of these things in a place that is free from sin, a place that is huge, a place that is safe, a place that is magnificent, and a place where you have all eternity to enjoy the creation of our Lord. People come and go through these gates and they enjoy the work. They enjoy exploring the new earth that God has created that is free from sin, this place that is huge beyond recognition, that is eternal. It's people coming and going for all of eternity, enjoying life and exploring and experiencing the fullness of what God intended before sin came and destroyed. When we remember this concept of continuity of Genesis 1 and 2 and picking up in Revelation 21 and 22, what we think about is that we learn that there's much of what we will do in this future heaven, this physical earth where we will reside and God will be our God and we will be his people. As we get to think about all the stuff that we enjoy now, the stuff that is good, and we'll get to experience in a place that's even better. Imagine hiking up a mountain with knees that don't hurt. 
right? Um, imagine a big old glass of sweet tea on the back porch of a friend, and you can just shoot the breeze as long as you want. Imagine, imagine discovery and learning and advancement without, without things like exploitation and greed. Imagine traveling and sightseeing without pickpocketers and shysters and customs and TSA. Imagine family without drama. Imagine work that actually fulfills and feeds your soul instead of sucking life out of you every day you go to it. We'll talk more about this in coming weeks, all of this that we will experience in the completeness of heaven. But for now, we can just see this. All of these things that we can think of, the good things that seem like they, they are, they're good, pleasurable moments in this life, imagine them in this safe, magnificent, huge, physical world that God created where he will be our God and we will be his people and we will spend all eternity experiencing the presence and the contentment and the safety and the comfort of our Lord doing the things that God made us to do and enjoy all along. My friend and mentor, Gary Johnson, is the one that put together this string of words. I'll give him credit for it, but I think it just speaks so much to this, this desire in our hearts to understand maybe just a little bit what heaven would be like. And he said it like this. We've been, I've been saying it over and over again. Heaven, it's a real physical earth, remade by God to be safe, complete, magnificent, huge, full of believers from all over the world that come and go as they please, enjoying all that God created for all eternity. That's the picture of heaven. One author said it like this, Scripture repeatedly makes it clear that heaven is a realm of unsurpassed joy, unfading glory, undiminished bliss, unlimited delights, and unending pleasures. Nothing about it could possibly be boring or humdrum. It is a perfect existence. We will have unbroken fellowship with all of heaven's inhabitants, and life there will be devoid of all of the sorrows, the cares, the tears, the fears, and the pain. That's a place I want to be, and it's a place I want for you. I told you uh, last week, uh, October 2nd, a date to keep in mind. October 2nd, we're having a baptism Sunday. Now listen, you can, you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ by being baptized into him at any point that you want. I know sometimes people like doing it together. We had a couple baptisms last week. I think we got seven more planned for next hour. Um, so if you want to be baptized into the Lord Jesus, you can do that. If you want to come find me, we can talk about it. You can do that on the 2nd. You can do it today. But when I read about Scripture, what it says about this place, it's a place I want to be. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and it's a place you'll be as well. Father, thank you for today and for your goodness and your love. Thank you that you are preparing a place for us. And Father, thank you that this is just a magnificent place. It's huge. It's free from sin. People are coming and going and enjoying all that you've created and all that you've made, the stuff that we can just get a glimpse of here on this earth that you created in Genesis 1 and 2 but has been so damaged by sin. Father, we look forward to experiencing those things on the new earth where you are our God and we are your people and we are with you in your presence and we're safe and we have all eternity to be and enjoy and to experience all that you've made. That is what we look forward to in heaven. We thank you for that, Lord. And for Jesus Christ, who is the one through his sacrifice on the cross that gives us the only access to that. So Father, we give you thanks for Jesus for his life, for his death, and his resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.
communion. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered together, we want to lift you up as a holy, mighty, awesome God. Thankful, Lord, that we can approach your throne of grace because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that as we eat the bread and as we drink the cup, Lord, we unite together in the gospel message, the hope that we have. Because Jesus, you paid the price for our life. We celebrate that. We lift your name high today, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of worship today here at Fairhaven. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Um, I want to encourage you, if you have that bulletin available and ready, um, you can have that Connect card filled out and put that in the baskets as we leave here today. Um, we want to stand up together today as we end out our service and close out. We're going to be praying um, just as a, an over prayer for our folks that are on the Brazil trip right now as we speak, as they're ministering to the folks. Um, as well as um, if you check out the mission wall, there's some slides and some pictures out of your generosity and giving here within the church. Uh, the supplies that went down to Kentucky uh, to help out with some of the disaster relief with some of the floodings uh, down there. All the supplies got down there, and so we're grateful for that. So being part of that, you can check that out. We also just want to be praying for those churches and communities in those areas uh, in Kentucky as well. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to close out and be dismissed this morning. Would you Would you pray with me? Father God, as we are in your presence, and we're just, again, thankful that you are a holy, mighty God. Lord, we thank you that, um, that we can gather together and worship. And I just pray, Lord, that you would hear our hearts as we lift up prayers uh, for those that are on the mission trip in Brazil. Lord, as you have gone before them, and preparing the hearts, Lord, for the, the message of, of your son Jesus to the folks that they're ministering to. Lord, I pray for their, their safety as uh, they move in and out of towns and, and communities. Uh, Pray, Lord, that you would be with them as they um, encourage them with your message, um, offer healing and strength, Father, through through the medicine that they're providing. Lord, be with them um, in their journey and as they travel back. God, we want to also just lift up to you the, the communities in Kentucky that have been struggling with the floods and the relief from that. I pray, Father, from the supplies that have been sent down, that it would give a relief, um, it would give some encouragement and some strength, Father, for those families as they, and they unite together. God, we're again grateful for heaven and the gift of heaven that we'll one day have in your presence. And we keep our eyes fixated on that. And we thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith here today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful